All right. So Avery, good to see you again. And thank you for asking this question um, about seeing the dangers in unwholesome thoughts. That that's a, um, an important part of the practice, as I had just said before we put the video on, is having an unwholesome thought is unwholesome. And we have the, uh, let us say, the uh, results of those unwholesome thoughts almost immediately, like anxiety, tension, uh, restlessness, worry. Um, um, but if we wear ourselves out with those unwholesome thoughts, then we'll become dull. So um, these are the hindrances. If we, in fact, though, have thoughts about how dangerous those unwholesome thoughts are, now we're having wholesome thoughts. The wholesome thought is seeing the danger, seeing the disadvantages to those unwholesome thoughts, recognizing what they do to you, and seeing that they are doing that to you, then by having the thoughts that this um, unwholesome thought is in fact unwholesome, that's a wholesome thought. And it can be taken to an extreme in the sense of you demand of yourself to stop having those unwholesome thoughts. But this is um, a, a, a kind of more advanced kind of thing that rightly in the beginning for all students, we would use a diversion tactic. For instance, when the unwholesome thought comes up, we will change it to a wholesome thought. To remove the unwholesome thought with a wholesome thought. The Buddha has a, uh, uh, a little analogy about a carpenter and the carpentry back in those days, they didn't have any nails. What they had was pegs that they would hold pieces of wood together by uh, being able to drill a hole through it and then pound a peg in. They used pegs, in fact, even in wooden ships, um, even until the last several centuries. So the Buddha says is in order to remove a peg, the peg that you're going to uh, that you're going to remove that peg with another peg. The new peg, the another peg, is a smaller peg than the big peg. So we take a smaller peg and drive out the bigger peg. So um, that smaller peg um, has to be kind of in a middle path or a middle place in the sense that if the smaller peg or the one that you're going to drive out is too big, then it's not going to do its job. And if it's too thin or too narrow, then uh, it's also not even not going to do its job, but it'll be damaged or broken. So we have to have a peg that's substantial enough to drive out that unwholesome peg. And that uh, this is where the Buddha refers to it in the sense of gladdening the mind or brightening the mind. That we can drive out those pegs with a wholesome thought. And so this is where we get, in, uh, uh, get started. But now, surprisingly enough, all on your own, you're bringing up step number two that the Buddha refers to. And that is by seeing the disadvantage in the unwholesome thoughts and therefore we can take those unwholesome thoughts and change them into seeing the danger and so mm -hmm. this is a very good practice for you mm -hmm. that you can um you can recognize for instance when you're out in a crowd and somebody says something that uh, um, is a criticism or something that you don't like if you uh take that in it will be painful. So if you can see immediately, oh, if I listen to what he has to say and take it in, 
I will cause myself great harm, great dukkha. Now, most people, when they get criticized, they just feel bad. But you, now that you've gotten on the path, can say, wait a minute. Let's not take that thought in. Let's not harbor it. Let's not own that thought. Because if I do, it will cause harm. It will be to my disadvantage. Mm -hmm. And so then we can say other things about it, like uh, this guy really doesn't know who I am anyway. That who he's talking about is the Avery in his mind, not the Avery in my mind. So he can criticize some Avery all he wants, but it's not me. <laughs> like that helps, yeah. Pardon? I actually did, not I actually did notice that uh, at one point the other day. I had a, it wasn't, I don't, it wasn't like, it was once I was like walking down a hallway and someone said something to me or like made fun of like my hair or something. Uh, and I was sort of like, well, the, what he's criticizing or what he's talking about, like, doesn't really, like, that person doesn't really know me at all, so it doesn't really hold any weight. Uh, can you repeat that? I'm having a little trouble hearing you. Is the audio on my end, like, a little bit choppy? Pardon? Is there a, a choppy audio on my end? Uh, it's not choppy. It's muddled. As if you're not close enough to the microphone. Something, okay, sorry. Yeah, um, well, I was able to notice criticism and say like, well, the person they're criticizing, like those qualities, like that's something that they've kind of made up on their own, and it's not this like me. So I've noticed that from time to time. Um. Yo, know, did you get that? Yes. Yeah. Um, I was just thinking that. If we can remember to, to look at what we're doing, remember to see, then we can make choices about it. And we have several choices. So one of the choices would be to gladden the mind. That in fact, in that situation when he's criticizing you, one of the things that you could say is, well, thank you very much. That's very interesting information. I'll, I'll investigate that. So you turn it around on him that he expects when he's criticizing you to get flack back. Mm -hmm. Can you remember not to give the flack? Can you remember to turn it around to something joyful and wholesome and uh, grateful? That will certainly stop a lot of the um, uh, unnecessary dukkha, the unnecessary uh, stuff, because if you if he criticizes you and then you criticize him back, now you're in a big argument. Oh, I was curious about something. Say again. Hey, do you mind if I pivot topics? Yes, go ahead. You have another question? Sure. Um, once you've managed to get the mind like, in a calmer, more relaxed, uh, or like better state, what, what do you do once you do that? Is there, can I, how, how does investigation sort of work, like understanding like like what are what or who I am in the present moment? I've heard a lot of that stuff on YouTube, and it's it's been interesting because it's like people will be like, people who meditate for a while will understand that like, like uh, the present moment kind of like and the sensory information is sort of like uh, it's like all there is like the present moment, the sensations and the emotions like that's kind of like 
all that we've really experienced in the present. So I don't know uh, what to, how to kind of start investigating or what that would mean in the context of the Dhamma. Yes, that's in, in fact correct. Reality is only what's right now. And yet human memory is all about the past and human intellect uh, is all about the future. About um, what's not happening in the present moment, but everything that's real. Is real now. For instance, you had a favorite cup that you drink out of. While you're drinking from that cup, it's real. It's right here, but when it's in the kitchen and it's out of your mind, then it's not real. But if it does come into your mind, it's still not real until you go into the kitchen to get the cup. Now, here's the thing. Perhaps the cup breaks. Maybe you got it as a special gift. Maybe it was uh, at a state fair where something happened important, or maybe it's uh, got a good design or something like that. And so you really like this cup and then it's broken. Which means that now, uh, well, if you're in Japan, you might want to try to glue it back together. But lo but normally we don't. We just throw it out. But then when we have thoughts about that cup later, it's not real anymore. It's gone. It was changed. Right? So this is what that teaching is about is, is that only what's real is what is now. And the past is not real. It's dead. It's gone. And that um, if we dwell in the past, then are long for the past, then we're not really in the present at all. And not only that, but more than likely, we're going to be in bad feelings. Now, the reason for that true, uh, that being true is, is that um, the way that the human brain is, functions and, and works is, is that when something is dangerous, then we remember it much better. Why is that? Because of the self-preservation instinct. And so we tend to remember the things that are dangerous in order to avoid them in the future. All right. So if something really pleasant happens, you might remember that, but a whole lot of stuff happens and we don't remember at all. Then in fact, we could go to a college lecture and not remember much of anything, nothing, right? And uh, this is uh, the point about being able to investigate or pay attention, because if we are investigating and paying attention, then we're much more likely to remember it rather than just remembering the things that hurt us. But through life, we wind up remembering a whole lot more of the things that hurt us than the things that would do us good. And so this is why over time we begin to feel bad is because oh. we're remembering the things that hurt. That's a really interesting. I hadn't really thought about that before. That the mind remembers things that are dangerous over things that are actually beneficial. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out how to, like, what my kind of next step is. Because when I, I practice for about five to ten minutes and I get myself really good, and I think that's, like, perfect. That's, like, great. <laughs> but I don't know. I don't know. I, I guess what I'm asking is what next. Just okay. Because, I don't know. <laughs> well, a, a lot of people have the idea it's a very Western kind of thought that Buddhism is all about meditation. And it's not at all. But in fact, um, uh, this is a funny little story. I've said it before, but uh, uh, Catlin is here on the island and he has been over to Wat Rua uh, 
Pa Chiang Tong before. He knows the abbot there, and then he came to do a retreat at Deepa Bawan, and now he is, uh, in this conversation, he was on his way back to the Wat. Wat, Wat Rusi Pa Siang Tong is a very nice Wat here on the island, um, and they're treating him well. But one of the conversations that he said that he had had with the abbot before, when he was there before, he said that the abbot said, that all of these Westerners who come to his Wat are only interested in sitting meditation and they sit around all the time. Now, this is something that a Thai monk who has been uh, a monk for more than 20 years is surprised at how Westerners are so enamored by the sitting meditation. And so I asked Kat, well, uh, what do they do? And he says, well, in the evening chanting, after the chanting, they will sit for a while, maybe up to about 45 minutes, but that's the only time that they sit in meditation, that the rest of the day they spend in a different kind of meditation, an active meditation of remembering to be in the present moment to be here now, to watch what's going on. And this uh, very much um, uh, goes with what is found in the suttas, that um, going to the forest or to a a foot of a tree or to an empty hut actually has the quality of seclusion. And getting off by yourself is very, very important when we're practicing, but in the uh, the normal day to day life that people have, even inside the temple, they're not sitting most of the time. Like, for instance, you're going to school, you're doing things, you've got your life to live and that you're not ever intending, at least not now, to spend 14 to 16 hours a day sitting on the floor someplace in Burma. That's not your intention. Okay, which means then that our practice of Anapanasati is not going to be done in a formal sitting posture. It's going to be done in the here now about what's happening right now, if we can remember it. And so there are several things. One of them that I've actually mentioned before, which I'll mention again, so that maybe we can grind it in. If you really pay attention to what I'm saying, it will be of great value to you. And that is is that when we're paying attention to what's happening in the present moment, that means that we're going to pay attention to the body. We're going to be paying attention to how we feel. We're going to be paying attention to what kind of mind state or what mood that we're in. What's our attitude now? and also what's in the thoughts. So this is the four aspects of the Satipatthana. Now, another point, which is actually uh, very much in part of this, is, is that we have six senses. We have five senses that take in data from right now, and then we have the sixth sense, which is often not in the present moment, that the thoughts that we're having are thoughts of the future, thoughts of the past, thoughts of someplace else, thoughts of people who are not here, etc. And this is where we spend most of our time is in that sixth sense, the mental yeah. sense. Okay, that's yeah, that's it. And so what we can do is spend more time in the other five senses. With our eyes, we can look. Often we've got our eyes open, but we're not actually using them. And we're not use, thinking. Uh, we're not looking at what we're looking at. We're looking and thinking. We look a little bit and we do a lot of thinking. We look a little more and we do a lot of thinking with our eyes. And so the idea then is to start remembering that, oh, I've got these eyes. Let me use them more. 
Let me look and look and look and look and look rather than look and think and look and feel. Let's look. The same thing is true with music, but in fact, this is one of the training of musicians is they learn to listen and listen and listen and listen and not so much thinking. And when you're really listening to a piece of music, you're listening to it, and then a thought will happen, a thought will occur. When we're thinking about the music that we've just heard, we're not listening to the music that's happening right now. (laughs) All right? So we have the eyes and the ears, and we also have the sensations of the body, which is a powerful one, and that uh, basically from childhood, Little children in Western society are both taught and are diverted from um, the body itself. For instance, toddlers fall down a lot and they cry. They don't like it when the body gets hurt. So children learn to avoid paying attention to the body. Even when girls are putting on makeup, they're not interested in um what it feels like this this makeup on their face what they pay attention to is how they look and they're not really paying much attention to how they look because they're really thinking about in the future how will i be accepted with this particular paint job right and so it's a very much future oriented thing So one of the ways that we can bring the body back into the present moment um, is with the breathing and also um, you have heard possibly enough about uh, various systems. You've heard of the Goenka method and that one of the aspects of the Goenka method is uh, what they do is body scanning to make the body alive, to make it alert. Okay, so one of the things that we can do in the present moment just by, you know, for instance, looking and using the eyes or listening and using the ears, we can also pay attention to how the body feels, especially with the breathing. Normally what happens is is that the body will be in a state of tension and the state of tension is what you would call unconscious or subconscious we're not paying attention to it until it gets big enough and then we'll see it but we're not looking at it in the subtleties that's really interesting actually because where oh that that makes a lot of sense actually yeah uh so then like even then like uh if yeah i want i want to i want to what I want to do is I want to wake up more to it. To All right. Well, know. here's here's one of the ways of doing this is by start paying attention to what the body is doing. If you uh, if you have a na- uh, let us say if your feet are crossed at the ankles, a lot of people when their feet are crossed at the ankles, one of the feet will be bouncing up and down. If uh, you, you've heard about a man spread where guys will spread their legs uh, to, for dominance, okay, that's a posture that we should become aware of. Also, if, um, the, uh, if the foot is tapping, we should know it. If there is tension, uh, for instance, people will move their legs back and forth subconsciously, swinging their knees, uh bouncing around and whatnot like that so the body is doing things in the here now and we're not even aware of it so, aha go ahead oh this maybe maybe now i've been i've been paying a lot of attention to the thoughts up until this point and like kind of working with the thoughts but maybe now i could start to check in with the body and see how the body the breathing feels too and then i've got two of the like major like like two of the biggest like sensations like the thoughts that are happening and then how the body is feeling mm-hmm. wake up. all right so one of the things that we can do then is to play little games 
like make believe, make believe rules, not real rules, but make believe rules in the sense of um, don't touch your face. Okay, now um, that's actually quite cultural in many places that it's um, a social faux pas to play with one's face, to play with one's hair. But it takes some mindfulness to remember to look at what the face is doing, to look what the hair is doing, and specifically to look what the hands are doing. That we do a lot of scratching and movement of the hands subconsciously. That people will play with their hair. Mm -hmm. They'll do this and that and this and do a whole lot of touching of the face without even knowing it. Or noticing. We talked about this one before. <laughs> yes, exactly. And today, maybe when we talk about it today, it'll be a second hit in the sense of getting it in. Okay, so the first time that we talked about it, it really didn't get in. But today, maybe it will get in, so that you can start watching what your hands are doing, paying attention to them, and be in the here now. I have a complete beginner but i will do my best well don't try to do your best in the sense of in the future but make a point of that i am going to remember to look mm -hmm. at what the body is doing mm -hmm. and don't chastise yourself when you're failing to do that be happy that you can remember when you do remember aha i am watching my hands okay now, there's another point about it, and that is, is to learn about the sensations. The example would be, um, you, have you ever heard of the word mudra? Mm, it doesn't, it might have, I, but it doesn't, I don't remember the definition. All right. The, no. word, the word mudra actually has the word mu in it, which has to do with the hand. OK, so the mudras are actually hand positions and, you know, in Buddhism that there are a number of famous hand positions. One of them is this. Another one is this. I can't actually see your hand. Another one is touching the ground. Another one is this. OK, um, and so. Uh, beginning to notice the hand postures and begin to put the hands in those kind of postures. All right, so here's another thing is we can begin to play with the fingers. To get the sensation. All right, here's a question for you. When you touch your two thumbs together. Which one feels? Can you feel the feeling from this thumb? In the feeling of that thumb, can you get the sensation from both of them? Because in fact, the sensation will meet. And you can't tell which thumb is touching the other thumb and the feelings that it has. So you've got two thumbs touching each other. Can you feel the sensations in each one of them? Or is it kind of merged together in a, a kind of a vague sort of way? It's pretty merged. Uh-huh. So we can do things like rubbing it like this, because then this thumb will feel that kind of sensation. And does the other thumb that's doing the rubbing, does it have sensation also? So you can begin to feel, and this is really marvelous, because there's a, um, going back to this one, let us see if we can get it just right. Notice that the fingers are not touching each other. The thumb and the finger are not touching, not yet. I can't actually see. How it. close can they come without touching before they feel each other? This is actually a way of developing psychic power, that if you're in the body and experiencing the body, then people are not going to be able to sneak up on you at all. If we're, if we're paying attention to the body, that in fact, uh, one of the stories is well known 
is, is that, let us say, in the city, someone's walking down the street, and then they know that they're being followed. Other times, people will have a, a thief sneak up on, the, uh, on them, and they're not aware of it, but the hair on the back of their neck will stand up because the body is aware that somebody's there, but the mind is not aware because the mind is lost in thought rather than being in sensual awareness. So that's one of the qualities of someone who is really advanced in the, uh, the techniques of the Buddha is you cannot sneak up on them. You can't surprise them. They don't have a startle reaction because they're never startled. And the reason for that is because they're aware of the sensory input from around them. And the way that we can develop that is going back to that point that I'm talking about is when do the fingers, how close do they have to be before they're aware of each other? That in fact, right now at this distance, the thumb can feel the index finger, but the index finger is buzzing and tingling right now because of that thumb being close. And I can move it back away, and now that buzzing and tingling in that index finger goes away. But I can bring it back, and there it goes again. They're not even touching. I don't have to touch each other in order to feel the sensation. So you can begin to play with this. I'm going to have to watch the recording for that. I'm saying, sorry, what? No, uh, nothing. Uh, keep going. Do you, what are you doing with your right hand right now? You stop doing it immediately as soon as I mentioned it, huh? Mm-hmm. Okay. But in fact, that's one of the things that you do as a habit is, is that you play, you twirl your hair. A lot of girls do that. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, that, that in fact, uh, the psychologists say that when a girl is playing with her hair, that she likes the guy. So that's oh, yeah. not necessarily the case. What it really means is, is that the girl is paying attention to something on the outside and then the instinctive uh, habit of playing with and fidgeting comes up. That when we're paying attention to what the hands are doing, they don't fidget. Right. But when we're not paying attention to the hands, the old habits will come back and the hands will begin to fidget again. Fidgeting in the sense of playing with the hair, playing with the face, rubbing the arms, all kinds of postures that happen, what we call subconsciously. Well, they're not subconscious. They are conscious. We're just not paying attention to them. Yeah, I th you did mention that at one point. Uh, it, it's good to start paying attention to what the hands are doing. Like that can actually be a part of the practice or waking up to bodily awareness. Mm -hmm. Yes, so start paying attention to the body. That if, in fact, you are paying attention to the body, one of the things that we'll begin to notice in the body is the effects of the mind that the mind affects the body. An example of that is, is that when we get uptight or afraid, the body will get uptight. Literally being uptight is not necessarily a mental situation. Mm -hmm. It's a physical situation that we get tense. We when, get you uptight. When, you mentioned, when you mentioned that, I actually noticed, I was like, oh, my spine is actually in a position where it's not like relaxed right now. Like it actually is kind of tense right now. Mm -hmm. That in fact, you're you're making a point now that's important uh, because you're actually um, kind of quoting right out of the um, Anapanasati Sutta that the main reason why we're paying attention to the body so closely is so we can find the tensions in it and relax. Nice. So an example of that would be a feeling in the pit of the stomach. OK, like a sense of loss, a sense of grief, mm -hmm. a sense of sadness is normally in the stomach area. And then anxiety is more up in the chest area. But in fact, I was wondering and giving ideas about why that was true. And now I know that it's physiological. 
that there is an area of the body called the spleen, and in that area, it is actually a place of collection for de- for blood to accumulate before it's pumped into the heart. For instance, where is um, here's a good question to, a- to ask about this. Does the body always have just the right amount of blood? For circulation, you know, some of us in the heart and some of us pumped into the brain and some of us going to various muscles and things like that. Or is there a possibility that the body actually has an excess amount of blood that it keeps in reserve? So when we need it, it can be pumped. Does it have excess blood? Yeah, excess blood, maybe a half a pint or a pint of blood or whatever like that. For instance, if people always had just the right amount of blood, then we could not donate blood. But the fact is, is that we've had excess amount of blood and normally that excess blood is accumulated close to the heart. In the chest and the spleen area ready to go right into the heart which means that if the body has too much uh, adrenaline in the blood, then you're going to be able to feel that as a sensation in the body that we will call tension, anxiety, uh, restlessness. So the body actually has these components to that. This associated with our mental state. Mm. And if we can check and see that that's there. One of the ways of relieving that tension is by changing the thoughts that we have that is creating that adrenaline. But a a much quicker way to deal with it is by breathing it out. Breathing in, taking in oxygen, and then breathing out that carbon dioxide, breathing out all of those excess molecules, and um, let that heavy tension in the blood this accumulated in the chest disperse. And this is we can go around doing any place, any time. We can be driving the car and feel like that tension. And so we can begin to take a few deep breaths while we're driving. Oh, wow. Even while I'm like walking, I could. I was Even thinking. when we're walking, when we're sitting in class, a lot of kids in, uh, in class get dull. If you recognize that the body and the mind are getting dull, take a few breaths, sit up straight. Start Mm. to paying attention to what the teacher is saying. Because most of the kids are not paying much attention to the teachers. That's why so many teachers get really animated and jumping around the room and yelling at the students or whatever like that is to wake them up and get them into the present moment. But you as a student, you can begin to do that on your own. You can remember that you can sit up straight, pay attention, listen to what's going on, and not get into that dull kind of state. And that dull state is normally because the kids are thinking about, I wish I weren't here in class. Wow, it would be really great if I was out at McDonald's, or maybe it would be good if I was sitting in the pasture under the tree or uh, someplace like that. And so we have the idea, I won't, I want out of here, but the student is not capable of getting up and walking out. So he's got this kind of duality going on. The mind is outside the classroom, but his body is there in the classroom. Can we bring the mind into the classroom where the body is? The answer to that is yes, this is a skill to be developed by starting to pay attention to the body and his senses, all of the senses of the of uh, uh, humanity is located in the body. For instance, your actual eyes are not in the mind, they're actually on your face. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, so the, the physical point about the eyes, that's also true about the body. Here's something that's really interesting that the scientists have figured out is there are more neurons on your fingertip than there are in your eyes. And that in fact, they've been experimenting over time with this, that they can teach the blind how to see by putting, uh, let us say, warming leads in an array 
on their back. That they would first start with an array of uh, 16 by 16. That would be 250 little dots around like this. And then you can take a camera and put it through the hardware so that the image is a very rough image, a crude image, but you can begin to see that just by feeling the sensations on your back. After we get that, then they'll start doing something like maybe 250 by 250, and that gives even more discretion. And so blind people actually can learn to see if they can buy this very expensive equipment. Because why? Because the body has these neurons all over it. And so um, uh, some professions actually call for and require that some that the hands can see. An example of that would be um, uh, the mechanic is walking under the dashboard of a car and he can't put his head up there. He can't see what that stuff is. He has to feel his way around. He has to be able to feel is this are, are we getting this screw in right? Are we cross threading it or can we get it to actually turn? We can feel that tension. We can feel the screw. We can feel the hole that we're going to put it in and all of that kind of stuff and put that screw in and never ever see what's going on with the eyes. But we see clearly what's going on with the fingers. This is a training. OK, then in fact, some um, seamstresses can get so good that they can thread a needle by feeling. Most people are looking like that and most people can't even do it that way. They want a, a little metal spring to put through it. And then put the thread through that and then yank it through. So there's little assistance, but a really, really good um, seamstress can thread that needle without even looking at it. Mm -hmm. Why? Because she's really in tune with her hands. There's a lot of profession that gets us in tune with her hands. Um, music is like that. Can yeah. here's the point. When a person is playing a very complicated piece of music on the keyboard, it's the hands that are doing it. But the mind can't even think about all of those notes. One note at a time, but it's built right into the hands. And yet you haven't had much training in any of those kinds of skills. It's time for you to start training yourself. The training would be, can you feel each other? Do they have to actually touch before you can have the sensation or can you feel it at a distance? Can you uh, make sure that you know where your hands are? And one of the rules that you would have is the hands don't come above the shoulders that you keep your hands and the only time that they're raised above the shoulders is when you are intentionally noticing that like for instance reaching up for the something on the shelf or raising your hand in class or other times like that other than that we keep the hands down but there is an expression called a kimbo that when people are swinging their arms and, and walking and the monks are trained to not do that. When you're walking, you hold your arms and your hands still. And in fact, that's part of the quality of the yam bag. Achan Po uh, actually is part of the training. You see, there's, an old, there's a, a bag that has a wide um, kind of a handle on it. And some monks will put it on the shoulder like it was shoulder bag. But Achan Po would not allow that. He says, oh, no, you have to hold that bag on your forearm and you have to keep your forearm up. To hold that bag that that's the right way to, to carry. And so there's a lot of little trainings that the monks have that give this bodily awareness and that you can begin to train yourself that way too. Yeah. You start watching what the body is doing. Then I can be more aware of like, because ultimately, is it like, like I want to notice it so that I can kind of, like, it, isn't uh, awareness kind of like the whole point of being awake is that we can see whether we're like, what kind of state we're in and then make an improvement, right? 
Exactly. Mm -hmm. And that the body is yelling at us all the time and we're not paying much attention to it. There's sensations there on a regular basis. I would I say there's totally, probably five totally, or ten uh, or. Go I ahead. Could totally use, I could totally use it to, to wake up more. That's exactly what I'm recommending is start paying attention to the body, remembering to pay attention to the body, and that will be a very wakeful kind of thing to do. Because mm -hmm. with the body, it comes with the sensations of the body, the touch and the feel of the body will also put you in touch with your feelings of anxiety, the feelings of sadness, because those are also having bodily components. And mm. with that, then those two together will influence the mind. And so the mind will brighten up because we're paying attention. And with that comes more wholesome thoughts. So we we'll start with the body that influences the feeling that influences the state of mind, which now influences the thoughts. Yeah, thank you. Um, this is very uh, this clear. This clears a lot of things up. Very eye opening. Excellent. Well, that gives you something to play with now. To be in mm -hmm. the here now means to be in the body. Yeah. When we're in the past, there's no body there. No body, not a no body, but a no physical body that when we're in our remembrances, we rarely remember our own body. When you remember going to town, you don't remember your body sitting in the chair so much. But let us say that you're riding on a subway when you're riding on that subway, you remember the subway, but you don't remember your body. And mm -hmm. so years later, you can think about that railroad car that you were in, that uh, um, uh, carriage, but you don't remember your postures. You don't remember where you were standing. All you remember is your point of view. All right, mm -hmm. but if you're actually paying attention to the body, that's always in the here now. The body is here and it's giving off a huge amount of information or let us say of making available a huge amount of information. We're not paying attention to it because we're too busy thinking about something else. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. And so let's be here now, which means be in the body. Let's be here now, which means be with the breathing. Let's be here now in the sense of now we know if there's tension, if there's anxieties, if there's wants, if there's desires, those show up and manifest in the body. And also uh, using the idea of the word pain. That uh, in fact, this is where I, uh, people get to the point of not wanting to pay attention to the body because the body for them is a source of pain. Itching bumps, uh, dull feelings, sharp feelings, chronic pain, acute pain, all these kinds of pains. And so we don't want to pay attention to the body because we see it as a source of pain. A much better attitude to have, and it'll take a while to develop that attitude as a skill, is to see the body as a messenger, that the sensations are messages and that we don't like the messages, then we'll call it pain. But you can have a sharp, acute sensation and know it, but you don't have to hate it. You don't have to not like it. You can accept it as this is what the body is doing. Now, normally um, what happens is that there's been a real injury that the best way for that injury to heal is by keeping that area of the body still. An example is if the athlete uh, breaks his, not breaks his leg, but let us say has a knee injury, then the thing that the medical, uh, uh, the sport medical doctor will actually get him a knee brace. And what that brace does is it braces that knee into a particular position to let it heal. So long as that athlete is jumping around and moving that knee, it's not going to heal very well. It needs to be kept still. 
And if the athlete was paying more attention to what his knee was doing, he would hold it still. But he gets interested in banging the sport and doing all kinds of other stuff. Um, uh, an example of that, would, and I'm talking about the knee because I've had some knee trouble. And so the intention is to keep the knee, keep the leg straight and don't bend the knee. But then Lucky got in the bed one day and I let her just lay there and then it was time for me to move. And instead of uh, paying close attention to the knee, I moved it in a way that caused great pain. That was what was the knee was saying was don't do that. That's what real pain is. It's, just a, it's a message saying, listen to me. Don't do that. If you've got a, a broken leg, don't stand on it. Another mm-hmm. example is, is that if the arm is broken, it's best to keep the hand still because if the hand is moving, it actually moves muscles in the arm. So if the arm is broken, that's why they put the arm in the cast, is to immobilize it to keep it still. That if the, uh, uh, if the kid does not get the broken arm set, it will deform. It will heal slowly, it will heal eventually, it will heal with a great deal of pain, but it will not heal correctly. So they put it into a cast. And so now the kid's got a cast on his hand, on his arm. He doesn't like it at all because he wants to pick up his coffee cup. He wants to pick up a glass. He wants to pick up and write with his pen or pencil. He's got to take notes in class. And by doing that hand movement, it slows the arm down and it will give him pain. And the pain is don't use your hand. Now, it's very hard to teach a kid to hold his arm still, hold his hand still. So one of the techniques that medical people have uh, learned to do is to make the kid put a sock on his hand. If you put a sock on your hand, that will help you to remember every time you want to use the hand to not use it because you've got a sock on it, you can't use the hand very much anyway. And that will help the, uh, the arm heal is by putting a sock on the hand. Which gives me the idea that maybe you can play with that as an experiment for yourself is to go take a pair of socks instead of putting them on your feet, put one on each hand and go around that way all day on uh, maybe even to school. Just go around with socks on your hand because that will make you pay attention to what the hands are doing. (laughs) Yeah. It would be pretty bizarre, so it would pull my attention pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. And so if one of the girls asks you, well, why do you have socks on your hand? You can say is to keep me from playing with my hair. I'll remember mm-hmm. to not play with my hair when the socks is because it's really hard to play with your hair when you got sock on your hand. Uh. <laughs> Now, that's not a that's not a regular thing to do. I would say that it only be regular in the sense of a couple of weeks when the guy has gotten his arm broken mm-hmm. and, and having socks on his hands to prevent the hands from being used. But you can play with this as an experiment, maybe do it for an hour a week or something like that. Mm-hmm. Maybe 10 or 15 minutes at a time, because after you take the sock off, you're still going to be very, very aware of your hands. Now, okay, I'm glad you cleared this up, especially because before I was hearing investigation, I was like, what kind of, like, uh, I wasn't sure what kind of investigation it was, but uh, paying attention to the body and the thoughts, that's that's plenty to work with, for sure. Mm-hmm. All right, so you were asking, well, what do you do? Well, we're not going to be sitting in meditation 14 hours a day, but we can still be in a state of awareness much of the day by beginning to play with these techniques. To start mm-hmm. watching what the hands are doing, slow the movement of the hands down. That in fact, here's an example of, of what we're talking about. Say the guy gets home and now he's got the urge to go to the toilet. 
So he quickly unlocks the door. He sets his keys down and he goes to the toilet because that's what he's got on his mind. After he finishes the toilet duties, guess what? He doesn't know where the keys are. He set the keys down absent-mindedly. He wasn't thinking about the keys. He wasn't thinking about the hands. He was thinking about getting into the toilet. And because of that, he wasn't in the present moment. So he sets the keys down someplace. He goes back to look. And they're not where he thought they were. And he has to look and look for the keys. For in fact, if he had been mindful of setting the keys down in the first place, he would have remembered where the keys were. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is a mindfulness training exercise of being able to train the body with the mind to pay attention to what the mind, what the body is doing. What kind of posture you're sitting in? The Buddha recommends to sit up, sit up straight. Because if we're bent over, then um, it's either got a mood thing to it. Like, for instance, when people are bored, they'll do this. But if you take it straightened back up, you can get rid of that boredom and start paying attention. So the body is an important element that we don't pay attention to in, in the practice of meditation. We think that it's all mental, but the Buddha was very specific that he starts out with the body, to examine the body, to understand the body, to know the body, and to relax the body. Mm -hmm. And so in the Satipatthana Sutta, it talks about reaching, touching, grabbing, Become aware of all of those movements of the hands. And an easy way to help you do that is by putting a sock on the hands. Wow, that really will do it. Makes you very <laughs> I'll alert. Give it, I'll give it a shot. Uh, uh, because you, you recommend it, I'll, I'll give it a shot sometime. All right. Yeah, play with that sometimes. So this is how you make a new part of your practice is by, um, instead of just thinking that it's all a mental exercise, it's a combination of mental and physical. It's a combination of paying attention to the body because the body will wake you up to pay attention to your feelings. Your feelings will wake you up to pay attention to your state of mind. And then once we, I guess once we do that, we can kind of choose to be happy, huh? Maybe? I don't yes. Know if we can be optimistic. Yeah, we can be optimistic. Absolutely. Yeah, we can do this. Mm -hmm. Have the feeling of success. That I can take care of the body. I don't have to ignore it. It's not a source of pain. The body is a source of pleasure. Being alive. <laughs> that whenever people are feeling really, really good, they're moving their body a lot. They dance. They sing. They whoop and holler and, and uh, uh, move around because they're alive. And That's when right. we, That's right. And they're when aware, we feel they're bad. They're aware of their body and they're having fun with, the, with all the sensations of the, 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 what they've been given. <laughs> mm -hmm. Exactly. But when we are sad, when we're remorse, when we're having a pity party, we tend to stoop, we tend to shrink, we tend to... Um, not pay attention to what the body is doing at all because we're too busy feeling bad mentally. So, yeah, become alive, become vibrantly alive. Mm -hmm. Taking that deep breath feels really good. Begin to enjoy your body. Pay attention to it. Give it the service that it needs and deserves. There was <laughs> good, good catch. All right. Thank you. Have Excellent. a wonderful day. All right. You go have fun. You go you play too. with this thing. All right. We'll see you later. See you later.